of you appear to be discovering over there that there's a small ice cream bar. Uh, if you haven't already discovered it, uh, you, you might, might want to. Uh, I'm going to head over there soon myself. Um, so final panel of the day, scheduled uh, uh, from 2 to 3.30. Uh, we're going to bring all our panelists, or at least most of them, back for a roundtable discussion to tie everything together. The goal of this final panel is to identify where the gaps are in the current marketplace for cyber insurance, with the ultimate objective being to discuss potential solutions, hopefully. Uh, importantly for this discussion, we are bringing in several new panelists, uh, two insurance commissioners who will be introduced in a minute, uh, in addition to the previous panelists. We w uh, well, I mean, there's more than two of them. Uh, we two new ones, I should say. We want to explore what role government may have in the maturation of the cyber insurance market, and more generally, how our society can do a better job facing cyber risk. Uh, on that note, uh, we have a very suitable moderator uh, for this last panel, the CEO of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, Michael Considine. Uh, as CEO, he represents the interests of insurance regulators in all 50 states and a bunch of territories, et cetera. Uh, as you may know, uh, the CEO of the NAIC is a permanent position, so uh, Mike will have the opportunity to lead the NI NAIC, uh, hopefully, for uh, many, many years, which makes this <coughs> conversation so valuable in creating a dialogue between leaders in government and private sector experts in cyber insurance and cyber risk. Uh, prior to joining the NAIC in January uh, as CEO, uh, Mike was the global head of government and policy affairs at Aegon, one of the world's largest financial services companies. He has a long resume. Yeah, just, just, go to, just go to the just next skip stage. It's always embarrassing. Him. Uh, prior to his work there, he was himself, uh, and this is how we first met, uh, an insurance uh, commissioner from the state I grew up in, uh, Pennsylvania, from 2011 to 2015. Uh, he was, in 2011, uh, named uh, by the U.S. Department of Treasury as one of the first members of their Federal Advisory Committee on Insurance, which advises the Federal Insurance Office on domestic and insurance policy. That was a, a brilliant group uh, that was put <laughs> together. Uh, we had a lot of fun on that committee, and it was, uh, the big debate was over, the acronym was FACI, and the big debate over, we always had at each meeting was what we should call ourselves, how you, you would pronounce the acronym. Nice. Was it FACI, FACI, FACI? That was always our big debate. Um, earlier in his career, he was a partner at Saul Hewing and was vice chair of its insurance practice group. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Considine along with our third and final panel of the day. Thank you very much. I think we're out, I think we're out of time after that introduction. So, uh, No, again, appreciate everybody coming back after lunch. Uh, we had a fantastic speaker in Mr. Clark. I think he has teed up this final panel very nicely with some of his thoughts uh, and provocative commentary, and I hope we can leverage some of that for, for this discussion. And as Ben alluded to, really, uh, this panel is meant to uh, provide a bridge of sorts between the first panel and the second panel, so much like my beloved Voltron toy of my youth, we've taken the very best of one and two and put them together in a super panel that sits before you to hopefully tie these issues all together. And uh, it's going to really focus on, on that issue uh, between the coverage side and the risk side, and are we getting it right? Is there, uh, is there a bridge that's effectively been built between the two, or is that bridge a work still in progress. Uh, I won't belabor uh, the lengthy introductions you've gotten some of that with the intros uh, for the panels already, uh, but do, since we do have some new folks on here, I'll ask everybody just to introduce themselves and uh, then we'll get right into it. We will certainly save time for some questions. I also have my, um, my iPad up here. If you guys are more comfortable with potentially tweeting some questions, feel free to do that. Uh, you can just tweet me at, at Mike Considine, uh, and I will try to be sensitive to those, so build into some of those, and maybe I'll actually get a Twitter following that is a fraction of my 16-year-old daughters, but I'm still working on that and a ways to go, so any contributions would be appreciated. But Director Farmer, why don't we stay with, start with you, uh, and then just work our way down for, for brief introductions. Ray Farmer, South Carolina. Ted Nickel, Commissioner, Wisconsin. Beth Dwyer, Superintendent, Rhode Island. Carl Peterson with Marsh. 
Sean Henry, Chief Security Officer of CrowdStrike. Lauren Corrigenis with Nationwide. Herb Lynn, Stanford University. Peter Ulrich, Risk Management Solutions. Great. So let me, let me start with a question that I'll throw out to all of the panelists. And um, Peter, we'll, we'll start with you and maybe work our down, way down. And I may uh, exercise moderator prerogative and change the question a little bit as, as we work our way down the line. But uh, I, I, again, given the title of the, this panel and the focus, uh, let's start with the, the big issue of are we, uh, as an industry, um, well positioned uh, for the cyber risks that we've discussed, or do we have some, some work to do? Uh, basically, are we positioned for success or not? Success in winning the, the, the war against cyber? Yeah. I, I don't think it will ever be won because it's a, it's a never-ending battle. Cyber, I, I, Herb was talking about it, that we're getting better and better on cyber defenses, but um, attackers are getting better and better. New technology is coming out. So I think this is going to be a long, long process, but it's uh, uh, certainly making good progress. So what has to, and let me follow on with a question that I'll ask of, of the panelists, what has to change? Where, where are the gaps right now? I don't know that there's a solution because if you take cyber risk as a balloon, if I want to squeeze it in the middle to, to crush that cyber risk, that's fine, but the balloon squeezes out on the side. So anytime you stop um, one, one vulnerability, the, the hackers are going to divert to another place and um, mine that. So it's, it's a never ending, it's, it's a never ending fight. But uh, as Dr. Clark encouraged us, we, we don't have the ability to give up on it. Uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think we, uh, we certainly have some, some great ideas to talk about mm -hmm. how we do that. But Dr. Lin, your, your thoughts, are we well positioned for success? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and and at, at this point from what I've, I, I, I'm a relative uh, newcomer to trying to look at, at cyber, cyber insurance. But I see, you know, I've been to some conferences like this and, and so on, and what I see is a lot of uncertainty about how to proceed, how old models aren't working, how, but I don't, so there's an understanding that the old stuff isn't working, but that's all we've got, so we have to find a way of adapting the old model to, to the new, and everybody thinks there is something new out there, but we don't know what it is, and so we, you know, so what are we gonna do? Um, in that kind of an environment, I, I, I there is only one thing that I, I see as any has any hope of, of, of making progress, uh, and that's doing some experimentation to see what works. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know how and to what extent uh, the, the the regulators uh, uh, supervise or allow experimentation uh, of, of different things. But it seems to me that. As you need a way of getting some experience, as in as an outsider, it seems to me that you know figuring out, you know, letting a thousand flowers bloom and seeing which one of them is thrive and, and not is the only way to learn something about how to go forward in the future. Laura, from a, a, a cyber insurance perspective, again, mm -hmm. uh, how are we positioned, and if we're not positioned well, how, what needs to change in the marketplace? Well, I, I don't think we can say yet whether this is gonna work or not, um, whether we're positioned well or not. I think a couple of things that have happened that are probably beneficial to the insurance industry overall in that for the first time, I believe, we're having to be agile and quick moving and thinking on our feet and not relying on how we've done things for the last 100 years. And I think as that spreads throughout the insurance industry, that can only be good. Um, and the insurance industry has to do that if they wanna keep up with every other industry that's going on right now. So I think that has been very positive for us. I think before we're going to know how well this works or not, we have to hit something of a critical mass in insureds. And we're nowhere near that yet to know if this is, if we're going down the right path. Um, and I don't know what that number is, and I can't tell you when we will hit it, but I think until we have a substantial amount of insureds in force that we can watch what's happening, see how 
they, how susceptible they are to breaches and how they're managing it, we're never gonna know for sure what's working and what's not. But we are gonna have to do things differently and we've started that approach, but we're going to have to continue to do things differently, bringing in outside consultants to help us provide us with data. For a lot of lines of insurance, we just don't do that. We haven't started talking about how we include all of that into premium calculations, all of the money that we're gonna have to spend on these outside consultants. So those are, those are the issues that are coming up. I'll give you a discount. Okay, yeah, well. I was about to say, and Sean, as was one of those consultants, are, are, are your clients starting to think and act differently or is it uh, an education? You know, it's, it's, hit, it's hit or miss. Um, when I started in this space in the late 90s, we were focused on getting to the system administrators, the people that were hands-on, the keyboard, to get them to understand what this was about. And that was okay, but they didn't have a lot of um, decision making ability in their organization. And we worked our way up to the general counsels and the CEOs. We're at the board of directors level now. And I think that the boards are starting to see a lot of the liabilities that they face, both personally and from the corporate perspective. They are starting to accept and understand the risk. Um, so there's, there's absolutely changes that are being made to uh, Dr. Lynn's point earlier. There, there's progress, but the adversaries don't have to deal with regulations. They don't have to deal with privacy. They don't have to deal with, uh, with new legislation. They're just out to do one thing. And the gap is absolutely increasing. To Dick Clark's uh, comments, there are companies that are doing it right and that are winning. And we just, we need to get around the corner. And this industry, I think, in collaboration uh, with the private sector or working with consultancies can, I think, help to drive behavior. I think the analogy he made, we talked earlier on the last panel about healthcare. He talked about cars and putting the black box in cars. The insurance industry can change behavior. And when we start to change behavior, we start to win the hearts and minds of people. Mm -hmm. We now have to start to execute and, and make sure we, we turn that into concrete execution. So just to follow up, uh, given that you're at the board of director level now, what, what is resonating with those individuals in terms of this, this area? So we briefed, I personally briefed the board of a, of a couple of companies a few weeks ago within the last month on this NotPetya attack where they, they were destroyed, their networks were destroyed. Um, they, they recognized that um, what the risks were and what the consequences were of the attack and they wanted to know what they needed to do. Where did they go wrong and what did they need to do to go forward? And they were very, very direct in their questions. Uh, it was clear that they'd done a lot of work. These are smart business people, right? They, don't, they might not understand the technology, the ones and the zeros, but they do understand risk. And when they recognize, I think that they actually have not only an obligation, but the capability to, to push this down and to verify what's being done uh, on their networks, I, I think that they, they are starting to make that execution. So talking to the boards, they're recognizing not only the liability of the company, but personal liability and an obligation that they've got to execute and ensure that what they're being told is being done is actually being done. Not that, you know, Dick Clark again talked about Equifax. You're telling me nobody in the C-suite know is what Dick said. Well, th they're hearing what's being done, but what are they doing to verify that it's actually being done? And the risk is so high that you've got to have, uh, I hate to say there's gotta be some micromanagement, I think, in this particular area. Thanks. Kurt, let me turn to you uh, for, again, sort of your perspective on how the industry is, is positioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis the market, and it's one where you also are interacting with, with clients probably and following up on the discussions <laughs> that, uh, that, that they just uh, have with Sean. Uh, absolutely, it's interesting. I, so when we, we were excited when we can build a 10, $20 million tower back in the days uh, because we could actually cobble together four or five different markets with $5 million each. Now there's about $1.3 billion of nominal capacity out there for any one given risk. It's about six to 700 million. So are we still at the stages where we really need you know, more support, more capacity? Absolutely whatsoever. But you also think about it from an insurance perspective, we're always looking backwards from the historical side. Former underwriter, I walk in the room, what are the NFPA sprinkler systems? Those don't change. You know, that doesn't necessarily change from an endemic risk perspective of the risk characteristics. If I'm a property underwriter, I have sprinkler systems, I'm okay. As a cyber underwriter, I have to think about everything. 
And as a broker, how I explain it to clients is, we are doing the best we possibly can, but absolutely, once it affects the side A policy of a director's and officer's policy, so it's actually on their liability itself, that's when everything changes. And when we do get the buy-in of the boards of directors, it's a lot easier. We didn't necessarily have that several years ago. Now it's easy to get done. I walk in the room and I say to the CISO, you are the most underpaid in any organization. Everybody looks at them going, oh my God, oh my God, but it's the truth. And I think that that mindset is starting to change. And I think that we're starting to see more and more support for it. So the tools are getting better, the capacity is getting better, but it's just that unknown that's out there. If we do have another NotPetya, watch out. If it's more on a global nature, outside of the Ukraine, I think it's gonna be very, very, very interesting. Thanks. So let me turn to our uh, three regulators, uh, all sitting in a row here. Uh, <laughs> safety in numbers, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and maybe put a slightly different spin on this because uh, in part, I know all of us are here and you, you in particular uh, to get a better grasp of this area, this emerging area and the risks associated with it and the market reaction, both on uh, from sort of the, the industry side, but also from um, the, the cyber side of it as well. What's your, level of comfort as a community, as individual regulators, uh, you know, and, and maybe some of your individual experiences in your own states with uh, your readiness for regulating this still nascent uh, but growing industry. Beth, I'll start with you. Um, so we're, we really haven't moved to uh, attempt to regulate the issuance of cyber policies. That's really all in the excess and surplus lines right now, which I think is where it needs to be to really develop. Uh, what we've done with the NAIC Model Act is attempt to bring the awareness that you all are discussing from a board of director level at the insurance company, so that insurance companies are looking at their own cyber risk. Um, one of the, we, we have to be careful not to do something that's going to harm the market. And based on everything we're hearing and certainly everything that's been discussed today, the market itself is changing, so I don't know that our entering into with any regulation would help anything. I got nothing. You got nothing, Greg? I got nothing. Thank oh, you. you Beth, yeah. That's great. You're welcome. Um, <coughs> I, I really took to heart uh, Dr. Clark's message last uh, uh, last hour, and you know, it, it, for, from my perspective and kind of from what we've, we've heard this morning and, and today, um, you know, our, our chief role here, the three of us, is to regulate the industry and to do it in a, in a thoughtful way that encourages competition and doesn't sort of get in the way of new products and, and, and new ideas. But I, I, I really thought about, I was really thinking about some of, the, some of the ideas that Dr. Clark was talking about and how they might help us as regulators when we're doing our exams. We've now kind of shifted from a simple uh, financial exam process to a risk-focused exam. And wouldn't it be interesting as a regulator to be able to walk in with, I forget what that, that uh, scoring was, but that, that basically that, score, that insurance score on their cyber and, and have that conversation with, with the, the, uh, the C-suite folks when we have those, those conversations and say, look, you're at 600, this is an issue for us as regulators. Um, and you need to be spending more time on, on cyber and or more money on, on, on how you're dealing with your own cyber cyber issues. Um, so, um, in, in sort of, again, not, not over-regulating, but, but, but through a principled approach, trying to drive those, those public policy messages home to the, to the insurance companies who will then theoretically, um, start thinking about using some of those similar same tools or more, more enhanced tools when they're doing their underwriting of their own risks um, as, they, as, as they move forward. So I, I'm, I don't know that we've, you know, that I think, I think um, the earlier statement about we're still in the middle of the battle, I don't know that we've won any wars yet, but I think we're, we're getting a better grasp uh, on the, the extent of, of some of the exposures and I think as, as regulators, we all need to continue to have a conversation amongst each other on how to best make sure that the companies um, who, are, who are providing uh, coverage to their, their consumers are, are you know, not only um, in, in, some in, in many ways uh, financially able to honor the and, and to take care of the, the commitments they make, but also um, run
running in a way that they're not going to they're not going to suffer some of these these horrific and, and very very scary uh, uh, cyber breaches in the future. So um, it's it's just really it's it's really struck a t uh, uh, struck an interesting chord with me that, that we should be thinking about more tools um, that we can use moving forward on, in our in our assessment of the overall strength of our markets. So, Director Farmer, uh, as I know, one of our point, along with Superintendent Dwyer, on on the NAIC's own cyber insurance model, uh, I'm sure you've had a number of discussions with various stakeholders, including you know some of these industry executives. I mean, is this an issue uh, that is front and center for them, a top radar? Do they do they understand the significance from both a regulatory and risk perspective, or do you think that's still a message that hasn't gotten through everywhere? No, I, I think the message is getting to, to the CEO level and the board level where, where it should be. I think we've seen since 2014 that the insurance industry is just as vulnerable as any other uh, industry. We've had uh, at least a third of the citizens of this country had their personal identifiable health information compromised. Uh, we've learned that uh, health information on the dark web is uh, more valuable than credit card in information. Uh, so I, I think that uh, through the process that we've been through, uh, developing the standards and the data security model, uh, that um, um, you know, I've, I've seen an in increase in the level at the CEO level of increase in interest of, of, of this. Um, a couple of the NEIC staff, Eric Nordman, Brooke Stringer, and I participated in a, a tabletop exercise uh, back in June with the Treasury on the uh, uh, cyber uh, insurance industry sector uh, as a um, preparation for a, 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 a breach and what companies should do, could do uh, during that. And, and we had a, a gathering of probably 20 large companies that uh, were in, in the room and you could tell uh, to what extent they're prepared. Uh, I have, I'm just like every other regulator, I have our larger domestics in from time to time to see how we're doing, how they're doing on, on uh, uh, being ready for a, a cyber event. Uh, they're making progress, they have to make progress. So I, uh, I'm, in, I'm encouraged but uh, we're, um, we're not winning a, a war right now. Well, and that seems to be the uh, consensus view thus far, is that uh, at least in that first question of uh, have, have we solved for this problem, uh, I think the answer is, is no, not, not yet. Uh, so if I can, uh, let me pivot a little bit to the nature of those gaps and, and, the, and which ones really trouble or pose the, the, the largest challenge for this community, and I wrote down during the course of the first two panels at least some of those those gaps, those challenges that uh, might uh, you know seem to exist. Common language issues between sort of the insurance side and and the cyber side, uh, operational execution, lack of discipline, uh, complexity of the risks, uh, modeling of the risks. Uh, coverage gaps in terms of we still don't have a sufficient number of small businesses or mid-sized businesses even covered at this point. Uh, concentration risk, uh, both at the insurer reinsurance level, constantly changing threat environment, uh, and then I threw in uh, regulatory red tape. Um, but Peter, let me, uh, let me again start with, with you, uh, because I, I may be specific to sort of the modeling side of, of this, uh, just by way of anecdote, a number of us went to London earlier in the year to sort of just mm -hmm. meet with the London market and sat down with uh, the team at, at Lloyd's and uh, obviously this is an area that they are, are, are very focused on um, recognizing it's still growing and I think they had a list of sort of their, their top when they model stuff, they're, you know, they're black swan events that uh, concern them most. And there's, I think their, their biggest one was a massive East Coast cyber attack yeah. of some type. Um, how did they get to that? I mean, and what does that look like? And do we really even understand what that risk 
looks like and, and what are, how are you guys approaching, uh, again, given the complexities here, the changing nature of the risk? It's not like you know, an earthquake fault line or, or even floods where you have some historical ability to track and model for that. Yeah, that was actually a scenario that we developed with Cambridge University, and it was a power outage in the, the Northeast. And, um, and, and that's one of the key uh, pieces of risk management today for the cyber industry is looking at deterministic scenarios that we would call pl severe but plausible. You know, here's something bad that can happen, but not ridiculous. You know, there are some ridiculous things out there. It's like, well, you know, you don't manage your property book to the 5,000 year event, so why are you looking at this cyber event? So coming up with these severe events and seeing how your book um, responds, that's, that's what is being done by, I would say, most, if not all, carriers today. Absolutely. Dr. Lin, in that list of gaps I, I covered, anyone stand out to you, or, or is there one that uh, I missed? That uh, you I want to build on, 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 on what my colleague just, uh, just, just said about a cyber attack on the, uh, on the East Coast. Presumably, you're talking about a power blast power that, would, that would last a long time. Um, and I agree that uh, it would have the kinds of catastrophic effects that you were, you were thinking of. But then you say, well, I don't know how likely that is. But there are other events that are natural events that could cause such things. Solar storms are one example that could cause comparable power damage, comparable damage and comparable in both sense of intensity and duration uh, to a cyber attack, uh, to a serious cyber attack. Or, and, and, and that's, that can be modeled. I mean, there, you know, there, there's some pretty good solar weathermen out there that, that tell you about the frequency of, uh, of uh, uh, of these events, uh, and, and to me, the, the focus on, there's a sense in which the focus on cyber in terms of a power event is misplaced, because it's not cyber per se. It's that you want to keep the power up, and if the sun creates the power outage, or if a terrorist with some high-powered rifles and and, and uh, rocket-propelled grenades can take out the grid. That's just as bad, mm -hmm. um, and and so the so I, I, apart on this particular catastrophic scenario, I worry a lot that people are focusing on the wrong thing. Um, it turns out that you could create the kinds of power disruptions uh, that you worry about with a cyber attack with a couple of guy, you know, with several guy, several teams of uh, people with rocket propelled grenades and and rifles. I mean, that, that's that's not a good scene either. And we don't do anything about that. Well, I was going to say, uh, we certainly model terrorism risk, too. And yeah. if I had rocket-powered grenades, that's not the attack I would do. Um, and the, cy the cyber, the, the blackout scenario, I mean, that's very realistic given what happened in the Ukraine. So you know, you look at what can be done, what has, what has been done, and how much bigger could it be? How realistic is it? So that's, that's kind of where those came from that type of scenario. Thank you. And, and so again, for, for modeling purposes, the, the, situ or the scenarios that insurers are most focused on are infrastructure related or? No, uh, well, that's certainly of interest. I think the cy cyber physical damage mm -hmm. scenarios are the kind of things that are, that's the next horizon. You know, we haven't seen that many of them, but it's certainly a cause of great concern because you might not even be in the cyber business, but you've got that, you've got that risk. You know, I'm a property writer. What's 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 the likelihood of um, a commercial fire being caused by uh, a hacker, um, either by um, uh, attacking the boiler room or laptop fires? There's a lot of ways to do it, and so that that's the big unknown right now. Is you know, I don't ha I don't e I'm not even in the cyber business, but I have cyber exposure. So, Laura, on the uh, on that road to success, the, some of those hurdles that I, I mentioned, is is there one that uh, focus for you or a concern? Well, there's there's several that are of concern, but I think based on what we've said so far on this issue, one of the things about underwriting is there's concept and then there's reality, and and when you are a line underwriter and you are sitting at ri looking at 15 risks a day and deciding whether you're going to write them or not, and that's reality. And, and underwriting is gambling with other people's money. That's just what it is. And we 
tend to try and gamble with as much information as we can have in front of us, but we still, at best, maybe know 70 or 80 percent of what we'd like to know about any given risk before we make a decision. And with this line of insurance, I think that becomes an even bigger deal. But when you are out underwriting on an account by account basis, we know that the insurers and the modelers may be thinking about the types of incidences that you're talking about. What an underwriter is probably going to notice is over a month how many of their insured say they use Amazon Web Services, and that becomes a concern to them when they just tally up in their head, oh my goodness, how many of my risks are doing that? And so those are trying to get that connection between these big catastrophes that we may be modeling to versus what an underwriter is going to think about when they look at a risk and try and determine if it's good or bad it is kind of a disconnect that needs to be brought together better and, and I'm not sure how because it is hard to keep all of that in mind all of the worst case scenarios in mind when you're looking at a chain of dry cleaners in the Midwest or you're looking at a chain of grocery stores or a pe people that manufacture boat motors, those types of risks, you tend to forget those things out there. And yet that's 95% of the types of risks that we write when we write cyber coverage. So those, that would be my comments on it. Sean? Ask me a new question. New question. <laughs> None of those scenarios, what's the scenario that you get uh, asked most about by by the clients, is it? Uh, are they are they looking at the infrastructure risk? Are they looking at the? Well, it's the it's the, the not petcher risk that we talked about earlier. The catastrophic risk that the organization loses the ability to operate. They can't function. It's the targeting against critical infrastructure like the electric power grid, where they can't function. A not petcher attack in the financial services industry would have catastrophic risk across this entire country. In fact, it would it would bring globally the economic impact it would have globally. If, if banks and Wall Street shut down for days or weeks or months, unable to operate, it would be catastrophic. It would be global catastrophe. So you heard from Dr. Clark at lunch that the one segment he felt pretty good about was actually Wall Street banks, an assessment you share, or? We heard from Sean Henry on panel two, who said the same thing. I was glad he confirmed it. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that they're that they're very good at what they do, but they're not all immune, and there are pockets of success, and there are those that are not as as successful. And, and where are the, the the weak links in the chain then? Um, uh, certainly, the big banks, for all the reasons he discussed, they, they're able to lure talent in. Uh, I mean, there are CISOs that are making seven-figure salaries regularly in that in that sector. Um, they've got the right technology. They're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in security. So they're, they, they've got the resources because they can very closely align um, an attack with a direct dollar loss oftentimes. So they, are, they can articulate the ROI for their investments. So the big banks are doing well, but the vast majority of banks in this country are not big banks. And there's a whole segment that um, could w is, is vulnerable. It does not vote mean that because the big banks are among the best that they're immune either because there are, um, we, we talk about the, the attackers changing their tactics every day, that there are new vulnerabilities that come into play that can be um, exploited. Um, there's the insider threat where regardless of how good your security is, there are people who can, who can take actions and to Dr. Lin's point, I mean, somebody comes in with a, an explosive device in a server farm, it doesn't matter how good your cybersecurity is. Oh, gosh, we just uh, keep getting darker and darker on, on this one. But uh, <laughs> Carl, hopefully, <laughs> concentration risk, not an issue, right? To uh, give us some good news here. <laughs> no. No. Something you worry about uh, in terms of both the, the company's writing or the reinsurance? I, I'm still am concerned, as I said earlier, about trade secrets. Um, huh. I really do want to hone in on this. And it's also from a societal standpoint as well, so it's just not from an insurance perspective. And you have to think about what is, for a publicly traded organization, you look at somebody's 10Q, 10K, and there are very, very limited notations in terms of IP. Um, there might be the number of cases that they might be involved with from the patent side, but really, I've had companies where the entire kernel of their software is gone. 
and they have not mentioned anything from a SOX requirement because it's not necessarily required. Mm -hmm. So if you have organizations that are out there that you're losing the keys to the kingdom, and all of a sudden your shareholders aren't aware of that, that's also an endemic issue elsewhere. But again, it's not regulated by the government right now in terms of having intangible assets present on anybody's asset sheets other than FASB regulations in terms of FASB 137, right? Or 157, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it's what's interesting on that side, again, it's only those, those amounts. And so I look at it, um, Sony, great example. Sony CEO said, we had our $400 million of insurance covered everything. No, it didn't because it didn't cover the net economic loss of the future revenues of those movies. Mm -hmm. And you can, there's, re, there's so many different cases that are out there. There was a great case here in the Valley where somebody actually embedded open source code into their firmware. They had to actually take out that product away from everybody. So huge product recall issue. Is that a cyber issue, is it an IP issue, is it a tech ENO issue? Everything's combining them together now. And that's my main concern still is the intangible assets the proverbial Coke formula is no longer stored in a safe, it's stored on somebody's server. And if I have access to that, watch out. As a insured, I'm extremely nervous. As a broker, my clients are asking for that though all the time, so I need to find capacity, I need to find a viable solution for them, and damn well we will. And it will change over a period of time, but that's my biggest risk issue right now of the heart and soul of everything that we do. Everybody's talking about cyber espionage, cyber losses here. Mm -hmm. The perceptions are that my trade secrets are gonna be covered and they're not. So we as an insurance industry need to do something different about that. And is that a, a, a coverage design issue or is that? Coverage is there, um, it's just we need to get capacity with the, with the carriers on notable capacity, meaning northwards of 300, 400 million. So again, let me, let me turn to uh, the, the regulators on the issue of the nature of, of the gaps uh, and, and those that sort of trouble you most uh, as we build a bridge to making sure we, we meet those coverage needs. And a couple that uh, I know our community has talked about are, again, the, the low number of businesses that are, are currently covered. Um, the regulatory process for moving to from a surplus lines to an admitted market how are we going to do that given a product uh, that is constantly changing, risks that are constantly changing, and therefore likely policies and rates that are constantly changing? Your collective thoughts on, on some of those, those current challenges and, and what regulators are doing to address them? You wanna start? Sure. Um, so I think as everyone's discussed, um, Really, everything's happening now in the excess and surplus lines, which is not subject to form and rate review. But as we discussed yesterday, you do have form and rate review when you come to the license market. I mean, we are 56 separate jurisdictions. I think the vast majority of us have <coughs> a commercial special risk law in addition uh, to you know the surplus market. Uh, so that's the big risks, and that frees you from form and rate review. So now we're down to licensed carriers that want to write the smaller risks, and there's no question that has to happen. Uh, my personal opinion is if a company is interested in that space, what companies normally do now is they take the 56 jurisdictions and strategically decide where to file first. Uh, and by the time they get to your jurisdiction, they might have already been seen in 30, or, but it's a lot of work on the company's behalf. It's, it's work on our behalf. I mean, I would suggest that a company that wants to write in the licensed market for small employers maybe come to the NEIC, come to the Cybersecurity Task Force with their idea, to and we can assist in coordinating that. We are certainly not a super regulator. These are 56 separate jurisdictions, but uh, it might be a way to coordinate your idea and get it out to commissioners before you go ahead and make your filings. Um, so if that's just an idea, if someone's interested in that space. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and, and it was it was a bit of an eye opener yesterday, Laura, when you brought that. That <laughs> I'm that wishing I hadn't. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's a good we thing want we, that to be brought up. We, <laughs> we otherwise we're perfect, but um, we just found <laughs> yeah. out we weren't perfect on one issue, and wanted, and, and but it, when you bring those things to our attention, it's it's really helpful because I don't know that we all uh, identified that as a top of mind issue for us, and, and it certainly is for for you folks. So. Um, that's that's an area where we can Im improve on, and, and I, I would welcome.
welcome continued conversation with that because we do have structures in place for, you know, for filing. Uh, theoretically, more quickly, and and but anyway, we we should we should have a, a further conversation about that. I, I, I as as we talked about a little bit um, this morning, uh, this this issue of of you know very sophisticated large corporations with you know security officers and IT professional all that. I mean, a lot of them are getting it. Obviously, we still have. Areas where, where where people fall down, but um, the the concern I have and, and the hope I have is that is that we're um, able to assist and, and companies are able to um, meet the demand and, and and educate folks on the on the, especially in the smaller business space and the small um, mom and pop space about the need for identifying cyber issues or at least. Being being interested in, in having the conversation about doing an assessment of their ci cyber vulnerabilities and fixing them. Number one and number two, uh, for uh, purchasing coverage to protect them and and their uh, and their their business should some something go wrong. So that was a that was really a, uh, a, a an interesting thing where I think we could again have a partnership. I think regulators could also assist in the educational component of identifying. This as a, as, a, as a major issue and trying to push out uh, 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 information to uh, to consumers and or uh, folks that interact with them to, to be better to better understand the, the, the risks they face. I, I want to just touch on one other area that that um, um, we all should be we, we all should be thinking about, and I think somebody mentioned the fact that we always sort of regulate the the, ra the last crisis. So you know, Dodd Frank fixed everything that will never happen again, um, with regards to you know mortgage-backed securities, commercial and residential mortgage-backed securities. That's not going to happen again. We need to be thinking about. We need to be using our macroprudential uh, work to identify the next crisis and the next area of concern. And and certainly the conversations we've had this morning and this afternoon um, about cyber being a potentially um, large threat um, are are areas that. We as regulators should be again thinking about a lot and, wor and working very closely with with our partners in, in industry and, and 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 perhaps even in other governmental entities to to continue to try to wrap our arms around so we don't face um, another systemic threat without without sort of working through um, how we might how we might deal with that ahead of time. So I, I always struggle with with again with regulations that come out to again fix a problem that's already occurred. So we need to, you know, we need to be a little bit more, more forward-looking and and identify those issues. And whether it's again systemic, systemic uh, risk faced by a concentration of, of, of cyber insurance in, in several large companies, or if it's the the threat of the interconnectedness between businesses and individuals and and, and you know IoT, um, those are the kinds of things that we really need to be focused on moving forward. Director, again, uh, as you travel the state, now increasingly the uh, the country talking about uh, cyber on behalf of the NEIC, for let's focus more sort of on uh, the consumer side, uh, businesses, small, medium in particular. Uh, is it an area where you, uh, as a regulator, are, are starting to sense uh, more questions, especially in light of some of these breaches? And, and how uh, are, do you think your position in terms of the education part of that? Well, we're we're seeing that um, you know the larger companies get the the issue. They, they basically understand that they're pouring a, a lot of money um, at at the problem itself. Smaller companies, this applies to um, insurance companies as well as other businesses. Uh, small and medium companies um, sometimes don't have the resources to uh, ad address cyber issues. They Put it on the back burner until there is a breach, and, and a breach in, in a small or medium company um, can take them out pretty pretty quickly. I, I think. So one of the concerns that I've got is on the insurance side itself. Larger companies are in decent shape, but I don't think we've got the message out to the small and, and medium sized um, companies on being cyber aware and and uh, uh, 
cyber security. Uh, I think that that's a concern. We've uh, worried about um, what companies are writing the, the business itself. Um, you know, the uh, cyber working group developed um, a, a financial supplement to, uh, to the annual statement to try to determine how much business is being written, where it's being written, whether it's standalone or package policy, and we, we're seeing that now. Um, but we're also seeing very few companies uh, outside the large ones are even purchasing cyber in insurance coverage. So I think that's going to be a concern for, for all of us. If you have a, a small or medium-sized company trying to write cyber uh, coverage as an accommodation, um, that company's going to end up in somebody's guarantee fund if we're not careful. Uh, and, and that's one of the last things that, that we need. So I, I think as the NEIC that we need to start uh, spending more attention uh, directing it to smaller and medium-sized uh, insurers as well as um, consumers. Duly noted, Director, duly noted. Uh, before we move on to the next question, again, in an effort to create uh, as much of a dialogue as possible, allow for any response, rebuttal, ret retraction, retort on anything you've heard thus far, uh, following up? So everybody's good with everything so far. I barely <laughs> kumbaya <laughs> panel. I like that. Uh, but let me let me move on then to um, an area that I think for regulators we we heard a common theme uh, these past couple days in terms of uh, the need for information sharing, transparency, uh, you know, organizations uh, that allow information sharing and analysis organizations, again, which we heard about uh, more today, uh, for this area to, to really function properly approach, uh, and appropriately, you have to have a level of cooperation and collaboration that's sometimes really tough for competitive businesses to engage in. Uh, and I'll just open it up to this group in terms of thoughts or experiences on how you build that trust. Uh, we heard yesterday uh, some great conversation around this whole concept of trust communities, uh, but you know, and even just how do we incentivize uh, participation in these information sharing and analysis organizations. So any thoughts, experiences uh, on building that framework or to be, uh, controversial is, is that really not something that is effectively going to happen in a competitive industry, an industry as competitive as, as insurance can be? Well, I certainly had uh, some very analogous conversations in the early days of catastrophe modeling. So back in the early 90s when our company had built hurricane and earthquake models for the property writers and it was usable by all writers. But some of the biggest companies came to us and said, we have more data than anybody else. Um, why don't you build a custom model for us? And we chose not to do that because no matter how big you are, whether you're State Farm and homeowners or AIG and cyber, if you have 15% of the, um, the market, that means you, there's 85% of the market that you don't really know everything about and there might be huge gaps. And it always served us to pool um, industry data on losses where we would get 60, 70 percent of the industry to, to share information about losses which would enable the, the building of better models. And, and that's certainly, um, and, and hurricanes are much more out there in the public than say a cyber attack where it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in the darkness. So I think there's certainly an opportunity if, if uh, the insurance industry aggregates and shares some of their cyber data everybody will understand the risk better, um, which leads to better risk management and is a good thing for the industry as a whole. But I think the problem with that though is, is uh, you know, with, with, with storm loss data, it, it is what it is. The wind mm -hmm. blew, we paid the claims, and here's how we handled them, and here's, you know, a description of them, and you can, you can sort of aggregate those, but I think, uh, uh, Richard Clark also brought up the fact that nobody wants to share the, their cyber information because it, it, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's about you know it's about a failure of of uh, you know if it's a company, it's about a failure to protect itself. It's about mm -hmm. getting it's it's about getting getting not having not having the right protections in place and suffering a loss because of that. So 
I'm sure that you know nobody wants to be you know nobody wants to share that data and be embarrassed about it. So if there's a way or if there's a facility um, uh, where we can where we can where it can be deposited and aggregated and then shared for modeling purposes, mm -hmm. that, that would be that would be terrific. But it's I think it, there's a lot of trepidation um, to again mm -hmm. kind of share something that's that's truly embarrassing versus versus catastrophic claims, which are just, you know, you, you may have, you may have uh, oversold in a particular area and you can be a little embarrassed about, about a high con a risk concentration, but it's, it's paying, it's, it's, you know, it's loss data. It's, tip, you know, it's traditional loss data. I, I've had extensive experience with the ISACs going back 18 years. I spoke at the FS ISAC last week and I'm speaking healthcare ISAC and aviation ISAC over the next three weeks. So a couple things. I, I, I disagree with one thing that Dick said, which is that, um, first of all, they'll, they'll share threat information. Companies won't share competitive information, but they'll certainly share threat information because there is, there is certainly a philosophy that a rising tide raises all ships. And if you suffered last week, I'm gonna suffer tomorrow, and Bob's gonna suffer next week, so we can share that information. Um, I, uh, I, there is a way for intelligence to be shared anonymously, and people can talk about threats and threat actors without saying that it actually impacted us, right? They can say, look, here's what we saw. Here's what we found. We found this new technique, this new piece of malware. They don't have to say that, you know, we got hosed and we lost $40 million, but right. they can talk about what they've seen because every, every uh, company, many of these companies have researchers, their IT security folks that are doing, doing this. There's some value to the ISACs, and I think that we're better off with them than without them. But the problem, I think, the gap with the ISACs is the inability to share intelligence at the speed of the network. Mm. The way the intelligence is shared is through relationships, which is important. You've got to have trust relationships. But it happens through email lists or phone calls or periodic meetings. Mm. I saw something today, and I call you up and I tell you about it so you can better prepare yourself tomorrow. But that's not moving at the speed of the network. And the network is, we, we have to find an automated way to share tactical intelligence that can be actioned. And you'll notice I've used the word intelligence, not information, six times. Mm -hmm. It's not about information, it's about tactical, actionable intelligence that can be shared. Dr. Lee? I have, um, Richard Clark mentioned an institute, I think, yeah, and to, to do some of the things, maybe, you know, maybe the, you know, an offshoot of, of, of NAIC is the institute. Um, but I have wondered whether or not there's a way, and this is a speculation, so I don't have any good ideas about this, but it, somehow the, the idea seems right to me, that in addition to the an anonymity and the aggregation that something would do, somehow if you could find a way of monetizing the data that you would, that you would collect, uh, that you'd wanna collect, it would give institutions uh, some self-interest in sharing the, the data that, 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 that you want. I'm not sure how to do that, I don't know, know how to price it, but somehow to me that the idea that, that you're expecting to share the information and something that you, you want to keep and you know, it obviously has value to you, maybe there's some price, at, some reasonable price at which you'd be willing to more readily part with it. I mean, that's speculation, I don't know, but I just throw that out as a possibility. Superintendent, director, is this uh, in terms of compelling uh, sharing of information or at least examination of sharing information? Is that, that something that regulators should start to think about or are already thinking about? We've, we've done it in other areas. If you look at the advisory organizations, uh, the information that workers comp carriers, uh, the lost data that's put into an, an anonymous way uh, and then utilized by the entire industry. Um, but I, I think it's, it's definitely something that companies are concerned about. I mean, at both with the IAPRC and CERF, anytime we talked about public information, there's competitive principles, there's all sorts of things. So it really has to be a deliberate act if we're gonna do that. I don't think we've started down that road, but it's certainly something to consider. You no, know, I, I think companies need to share that information, but one, the existing vehicle now is the FSISAC and they, reached out to us to see how they can get uh, additional insurers in into that organization. So I think we should at least take advantage of that. But I certainly uh, was uh, intrigued by the uh, Institute uh, idea as well. 
new CEO can address that. Yeah, <laughs> just add it to my list right on healthcare reform. So, um, <laughs> any thoughts or reactions to to the idea of though of having regulatorily compelled information sharing? Is that not the way to go from a historical perspective, or is uh, would you allow self policing, self enforcement? Any thoughts on on that? From, from my perspective right now, it's, it's interesting just to see, just from a privacy regulatory perspective, you have 48 distinct privacy laws within the United States. You have Congress that's tried 12 times, 13 times, to have a national privacy law X of HIPAA high tech as well as Grand Leach Miley data. So when it comes to your standard retail laws out there, there really isn't a national law when it comes to notifying. If we can't get Congress, well, it's difficult to get Congress and the <laughs> federal government to agree on anything, <laughs> but I think it's going to be very, very difficult because people don't necessarily want to share the information. And then again, if that information, even if it is redacted, somehow is disclosed, that's another reputational risk issue. That let alone one more time, here's the government collecting this data, and you can see some Americans not necessarily wanting their data collected. So I think it's, it's needed, I think it's required, and I think the only way that we are going to have it if it is regulated. And it has to be that mandate, but I, as a broker, want to see a national privacy law. This patchwork that we have just costs money. The lawyers are making the money. I don't want to train outside plaintiff's counsel anymore about breach laws. I don't think that should be my job anymore. I think that what we do have, though, is certainly an understanding of where we need to be, but how we get there is the only mandate it is going to be if it is regulated. That's my own personal perspective. I would agree that, that it's going to have to become regulation. And, and we see it, well, you can see it with HIPAA. I don't know if anybody else has ever sat and poured over the big spreadsheet they have. Oh, yeah. of, it's fascinating yeah. reading some of the, yeah, yeah. you know, and every single breach is on there. And I think that's what it takes is that level of requirement that you have to report this bre a breach if there's over 50 people's records that were affected and we're gonna have this big spreadsheet, we're gonna track it every inch of the way and we're gonna put in there what fines and penalties we charged you and details of the breach. But if, if you're not compelled to do that, I don't think you're going to get people to do it. Correct. Dr. Lin, from uh, sort of uh, your experience though on the, the, the network side of it is enforced information sharing successful or is it better to allow these communities to, to self-regulate, self-police? My usual instinct in, when faced with a question like that is um, uh, I would try self-policing first uh, and, and, and say if it doesn't work, uh, then we'll come in with regulation and, 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 and force you. Uh, and then be very, very prepared to force. So I think this would also be a good opportunity, um, given that we do have our, our regulators on the panel, really haven't had a chance too much to talk about our cyber insurance uh, model and the work that's been done on that. Uh, and, and again, leave it up to, to our three regulators. Will that help address some of, some of these issues? How, uh, maybe talk a little bit about how from a design Sure. Uh, perspective, you all approached this to, to, to deal with it so it wasn't necessarily a, a prescriptive moment in time kind of regulation. Sure, the short answer is yes, it, it will certainly help because uh, uh, companies will be required to report to their domestic regulator uh, within 72 hours of, of the, the breach or, or knowledge of, of the breach, but we have um, uh, developed a uh, Data Security Model Act uh, it uh, was probably about the easiest thing we've ever done as an EIC, <laughs> and we did it in probably, you know, a day and a half. Uh, actually, it was, um, we've been at this for pretty close to two years, developing the data model. Um, we are about to vote on our sixth version of, of the model. It's no, come. The final version. It, oh, indeed. Uh, <laughs> trust me. Um, we, um, uh, the sixth version has already gone through the Cyber Security Working Group, the Innovation Technology Task Force, and now on October 24th, the Executive Committee will, will take it up and, and it will be a, a adopted at, at, at that point. Um, it has been a collaborative effort between um, 
anyone that wanted to participate. Uh, companies, trades, regulators, consumers, academia, anybody we could find on the street that <laughs> wanted to, that had an opinion uh, on, on the model. We went through, we were about at our third or fourth model when New York was um, finishing up on, on their regulation. Um, as uh, most large companies that do business throughout the, the country, do business in New York, will have to comply with the New York reg. Uh, we modeled a lot of the Data Security Model Act uh, after the New York reg. Uh, we used basically the same definitions as uh, risk-based standards on cybersecurity and, and how uh, uh, you're investi you investigated a, a cyber event, report the cyber event, we did leave the notification to consumers up to the individual state law. As you said, 48 states have those uh, statutes, so we, we didn't reinvent the, the wheel there. We do have a couple of a exceptions uh, that uh, New York doesn't have. We heard from a lot of small agencies, small companies, but we have a small company exemption, 10 or less employees, uh, you're exempt from the, the, the statute. If you comply with the HIPAA uh, privacy law, you're exempt. So we, we've done a, a, a few things. I, I think it uh, is a, um, you know, it's been a long process and I think that's where we need to be, but it's, uh, it will be something that we'll have to uh, come back and look at just because the marketplace, just the cyber area continues to evolve uh, good and bad, so we'll have to, have to take a look at it from time to time. Beth? So uh, one of the things um, that, uh, that you mentioned that I found interesting, we spent a lot of time trying to get a notice to consumers, one model notice to consumers for the insurance industry, and I, I can't even express how difficult that was. Um, I mean, the 46 laws are all very, very similar. They're all uh, key off uh, notification at a certain number of consumers. That, so th I mean, the easy way to comply with 46 is go to the highest level and put that in for every state. But one of the things we tried to do um, with notification just to the director is utilize our domestic deference that we use in financial. So there was a, a lot of discussion there about, well, within 32 hours or whatever amount of hours, how am I supposed to know which consumers of which states are affected? So uh, what we deferred to was you notify your domestic and uh, when you find out that 350 or more consumers in a given state are affected, then you notify that commissioner. Um, we also, as, as Ray said, put in as much as we could uh, following New York, so you don't have two, we do not want anyone to be following two different models. The intent is if you're compliant with New York, you're compliant with this model. Um, and, and put in standards for companies that are risk-based so that we don't have the same standards for a gigantic insurance company as for a, a relatively small producer. So uh, we're all hopeful. I think Ray and I are gonna at least try put it through this year in our legislators and see, see what yes, happens. We'll uh, we hope more states will do it. Um, and uh, at least we're setting one standard for all insurance companies on what we're gonna look at. Well, uh, I, and I know personally the Herculean effort you all have gone through to uh, engage in, in very aggressive, transparent outreach and I, I, just the sheer number of iterations of, of the model I, I certainly reflect uh, our efforts to, to reach a, a, a good place. But uh, certainly welcome thoughts or questions from, from the panelists on either uh, directionally the, where the NEIC is going or your own thoughts around uh, regulation including, you know, is this such a big issue and such a big challenge and such a big threat that, you know, we should be looking at something like TRIA or a, a federal program of, of that nature as a backstop for, for the insurance side of it? Um, or, or do we leave it to the private market? Any thoughts, questions? Peter? Well, I think it's interesting you raised the, the concept of TRIA um, because, I mean, today the cyber market's not big enough to warrant warrant it because uh, the problem with terrorism was there were potential losses out there that the insurance industry couldn't write a check for. It was just not more money than they had in the bank. Mm. Um, cyber's not anywhere that big. But that said, there's certainly risks, and we talked about state-sponsored attacks. Exactly. Is that, is that really the, the responsibility of the insurance industry? I would say no, but then there's also the, the problem that we talked about of attribution. How do you say what a state-sponsored attack was? But um, 
think that TRIA for cyber is an interesting topic that should be considered. So uh, we've got about, well, I'm going by the actual stop time on the agenda because I, I know folks have travel plans, about 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit into um, you know, the way forward and how do we start to decrease those, those gaps uh, that we've, we've talked about. Certainly start to welcome people to think about questions. Again, if you wanna tweet that to me, feel free to do that at Mike Considine. Um, but we, um, I guess the big question, and, and, and I'll open it up and hopefully everybody can provide their, their thoughts uh, and I'll make it pretty open-ended, is how do we as a, as a community go about identifying and addressing the gaps between the coverage and the risk in a disciplined, uh, effective way? Uh, we heard you know, a number of suggestions through the panels today. We heard uh, Dick during lunch talk about the creation of an institute or you know, creating, certifying cyber ser uh, security readiness, uh, make uh, private information valueless, uh, shared information assessment programs for cyber, uh, the continued assessment scoring of risk uh, as, as one way to, to, or some ways to start to close those, those gaps. Um, but in an effort to hopefully give us an opportunity to come back uh, next year and talk about this and maybe some homework uh, for, for the folks at Stanford to think about, um, what's the process, your thoughts about how we, we start to, to close those, those gaps in, in a methodical yet uh, hopefully efficient way? And I'll, I'll start on this side of the table with the regulators and put you guys on the spot first. Mr. President? Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> how do we fix this, sir? Well, um, we, it, it certainly, it's, it's certainly, you can't wave a wand, you can't snap your fingers and fix this, but I think, I think the key for providing the coverage is making sure that the appropriate amount, and I, I think Laura kind of talked about it, we're still kind of flying blind, or you're, you all are still kind of flying blind in terms of ac uh, accurately pricing some of the risks. So the more data that can be made available for, um, for industry folks to, to better model, better price, better underwrite the, 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 the risks out there um, um, would, would be ex extremely helpful. The other, um, the other thing that, that I th again, I think these are things we can work on in, tr in trying to be better at collecting data and sharing data. The other thing that, again, you identified, and I don't mean to keep picking on you, Laura, but but it, from the regulator perspective, we need to be better about uh, being listening to the, to the needs for companies because these risks are so changing so rapidly and the, and the fact that the policies need to be updated so rapidly, not just layered and piled on with more risks and, and just kind of you know, you know, have a loss and then just pick from, uh, from whatever's been loaded on there, but, but actually targeted policies identifying, identifying real risks that companies are facing um, and having the, the Regulators speed up their ability to understand and approve those moving forward. Would I think would be would be very helpful. Um, I'll stop there because there's a lot of a lot of other areas that, that maybe folks want to touch on. But those are two areas that I think immediately we could we could do mm -hmm. we could start the conversation and get, work better towards uh, solving. Director, Superintendent, anything you want to add to that? Um, I've actually encountered quite a few people the last couple of weeks uh, that are attempting to sell to the smaller market or educate uh, the smaller employers about their needs. Um, we, you know, and, and what Ted said about, you know, if there is licensed companies active in this area that need coordination through the NAIC, I think a good idea has come to us um, because th it certainly is an underserved market. It's something that we want to assist with. Uh, it's unusual because, again, without data, when you file rates with us, mm -hmm. we're looking for your data on what you're buying, <laughs> you file your rates on, and there is no data. So, it's, it, but every new product is like that, and that's why it usually starts in the surplus market. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't work with companies and, and brokers to come up with new solutions. You know, I, I, I think since the market is um, fairly new and, and ever-changing, I think the regulators do not need to stand in the way of new products as, as they come through the marketplace and be as flexible as, as possible. I'm sure a lot of people ran that down. But they should. You know. <laughs> Take it to the bank. Carl? It's interesting. It's not necessarily from the pure regulatory perspective side, but um, even so, something so simplistic as a privacy breach. 
we don't still have clarity within this country of what constitutes immediate versus future damages. Mm -hmm. So great case is Judge Coe up here in Northern District of California. Uh, on the Adobe case, she completely took a completely opposite opinion of what other judges did within her own district as well as others on the West Coast. And you see these pockets around the country of not necessarily a formalized understanding and how one judge can take an effect and completely change the dynamics of the industry is something that's really unusual. And how do you model for that? Uh, a legal interpretation of a law or the ever-changing programs of what constitutes privacy policies within states. Uh, when Kamala Harris was AG here in California, um, she came out with some policies that really caused a lot of consternation for people. Were they good or were they bad? Well, again, it's a regulatory side, it's a judicial side. There's so many different bodies that are, that are involved. It's who's in charge? You know, do you have one single point person? Because what you have right now is you have way too many chefs that are in the same kitchen trying to derive that policy form. And so there has to be a centralized understanding from an industry side of who exactly is gonna own this. And I don't know if the judicial side, if the state attorney general side is gonna have the same opinion working with you as peers. That's my concern. Sean, he, way by forward. By the way, the AG no? is always listening to us. <laughs> what? Uh, oh. Only in Wisconsin. No. <laughs> Maybe you buy some cheese curds, but yeah, <laughs> deep fried. And we've gone off the rails officially. <laughs> note, note the time of the record. Bit of bit of a non sequitur. Let me let me throw out a concept that I think is important to consider, and we really haven't talked about it here, because we've been talking about how the industry can help to guide or incentivize companies to better secure their networks. Um, at the end of the day, there's a human being on the other side of this wire. Right, there's somebody who is attacking, who's stealing, who's blowing things up, who is infiltrating and then um, distributing data. There's a human being on the other end of this. We can have the greatest security in the world unless we actually stop the human beings. They're going to keep coming and eventually they're going to find a way in, mm. right? Because they're, they, they're going to, um, they're relentless and they're going to find a way in. So there's a couple, couple of things, I think. One is um, when we talk about intelligence sharing, um, the idea for intelligence sharing is not only to make organizations more secure, but if you share the appropriate intelligence to help to do attribution and identify who's launching the attacks, you can share that intelligence with government agencies that can actually take actions to help to stop or deter the actors that are taking these actions. So from a law enforcement perspective, if you were to share intelligence with federal law enforcement or international law enforcement, they could actually incarcerate somebody who's launching these attacks against the financial services sector. If you're sharing intelligence and identifying nation state actors, you may be able to, through some type of financial sanctions or diplomatic actions, take some steps to deter them from launching these types of attacks. Um, in, in, a, a, in the physical world, if in our subdivision, there was a gang that was rampaging through the subdivision and breaking into each of our houses and mm. stealing our, our uh, televisions and, and hurting our families. Um, could you imagine the mayor of the city or the chief of police getting on national television and saying to the citizens of this community, you haven't done enough to secure your house? That wouldn't happen, right? Because we'd be up in arms saying, what have you done? The government's fundamental responsibility is to protect our citizens. What have you done to protect the community? What are you doing to actually identify? I've got locks, I've got alarms, I've done as much as I reasonably can do. What are you doing to actually mitigate the consequence or mitigate the actions of the actors? So when we're thinking about how we, the way forward and how we solve this, there's, there's a role in this space for the commercial sector, for the in institutions, but there's also a role from a government perspective that the private sector cannot meet. They don't have the ability or the capacity to do it. And the sharing of intelligence, um, the implementation of certain regulations, breach notification so that there's, there's a clear flow of intelligence that allows for attribution, those are key points going forward. It's certainly a, uh, an important stakeholder to be at the table. Uh, so, and in your sense is it's not question of will, but a question of resources right now? Um, there, there needs to be, um, there needs
needs to be more focus. There needs to be a, a comprehensive program put in place at the national level. Right now, a lot of what's happening, there, there are pockets of success, but it's ad hoc, and it's not as comprehensive as it needs to be. There's not a clear line of authority. There are authorities that are, um, that are laid out across multiple agencies, and it's just not uh, as cohesive as it needs to be. So there needs to be some more direction, I think, and some more leadership that helps to formulate the plan and, and put it in place. Dick said, you know, he wrote the, the first, he was part of the first um, national cyber strategy. Well, I was part of the cybersecurity strategy as well, the, the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative in, in 2006 that was funded. It went before Congress and it was funded to the tune of $10 billion. Um, and there are a lot of people around the room saying, well, what happened to the $10 billion? And I would say, ask your congressional representative. I'm not sure exactly. There, were, there was some, some investment and there was some success, but yet we still suffered a breach through OPM and we suffered breaches uh, across uh, the energy sector and the financial <coughs> services sector. So um, there, there needs to be a lot more done in a more comprehensive way. Laura? Well, Ed. Three points I kind of want to make, but I'll probably only make one because by the time I get through it, I will have forgotten the other two. But <laughs> uh, the first one I wanted to say was in the conversation at lunch, I think the thing that struck me the most and, and is nearest and dearest to me because I have issues with how much data we bother to keep is devaluing personal data sounds like a great idea to me. Um, I'm not sure why my zip code should be considered personally identifiable information. and if we can come up with a way to do that, I think that would be a wonderful thing if we can actually do that. And I, I think it would save us so much money, time, headaches, personal angst if we could get to that place. The second thing was one of the things that I blame the insurance companies and insurance underwriters, the people at the companies that actually are creating the policy language, I think we should do better is whenever you hear about these worst breaches, it gradually comes out that they knew about it long before they ever made it public. And we know what each state privacy laws requirement time is you have to notify within X days of discovery. Very few insurance companies tie coverage to early notification. And if we did, if we were forcing our insureds to, know, to tell us about a breach within a certain period of time of when they discover the breach, not when it occurs, but when they discover it, it would go a long way to solving the issue of let's not report this until we're absolutely sure it's a total cluster F and we've all got to get worried about it. And that's what I think happens a lot of the times. And I think that is something that the insurance industry through cyber coverage could do, is say you need to tell us about it by this date or you're not going to have coverage and that would push that issue. That is one thing that is one of my hot, hot buttons on it. And I think finally, I'd just say that, as I said earlier this morning, one of the problems is we just keep adding coverages on to cyber and trying to adapt our underwriting and our rate structure and our applications and our policy language to all these different coverages. And that may be necessary and that may be what we want to do. We might want to look at taking some things off and separating them as well. One of the things that we haven't talked about at all today that is kind of a hot button to me is most cyber policies still cover online content, which isn't really network security related. It's social media claims. It's arising out of the content of websites. And a lot of most cyber policies still provide that coverage. And social media liability claims are on the rise and they're kind of a distraction while they're in when you're looking at network security. So I think we can look at coverages and say, let's separate this out, let's, let's give it the importance it deserves elsewhere, but just habit has us keeping that in the form year after year after year. So those are my points. Dr. Lynn. I think that I mean, there are two things we want, want, want to say. One is the, the comment that came from over, or all over on that side of the table about flexibility, raw, yes. Um, the, the, your, your insurance commissioners have a, a great 
uh, and deal of sway over what the policies and so on, that the call for flexibility is consistent with my call for experimentation and, and under, understanding the terrain uh, better, and that's the only way to do it. So, you know, right on, uh, right, right, right on there. Um, one aspect th uh, of uh, the security that uh, hasn't been talked a lot about here uh, has been the, the question of uh, liability uh, for um, cybersecurity breaches of various kinds. Uh, and, and certainly within the, the, the IT industry, uh, the idea of liability for, pro for products uh, and services that have some cybersecurity flaw that's gone on to be exploited uh, is anathema. Uh, and it's in fact one of the reasons that you don't have good cybersecurity uh, has been said over the years. The s good cybersecurity that you have because the incentives are all for pushing out functionality, pushing out new product, pushing out new services and so on. It's not for security. And the incentives to be first to market are very, very high. And uh, liability, uh, tort liability for that uh, is, I think, inevitable. Why do I think it's inevitable? Because I think it's the, the, the Internet of Things is going to push that on us. We have a, li a well-established liability regime for toasters. Your toaster <laughs> burns your house down, investigation, you can sue the manufacturer for, you know, for negligence, what, what, whatever, okay? Not when, you put, not when you make it an IOT, an internet of toasters, right? You, you put, a, put an internet <laughs> connectivity onto your toaster, um, and your, your toaster, your, your internet-enabled to toaster burns your house down. It's not plausible to say, no, 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 we're not gonna be accept liability because of the IT, because of the, the, there's a clause that says, no, 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 no liability for the information technology. That, that's not plausible over the long, that's not sustainable over the long term. So the question there that the IT industry is gonna be facing is, um, uh, are you, you know, not, Will we be able to have liability or not? That's not the question. It's what's the what's that world going to be like? And I think I suspect the insurance uh, business, the people who insure um, uh, company, IT companies and services and so on, are going to have a lot to say ab uh, about that. Um, so if you can push that, I think you make a big difference in the cybersecurity posture. as a modeler rather than an insurer or regulator, maybe I have a slightly different view. I mean, all my clients are incredibly bullish on cyber as an opportunity to grow. They're all making money. Sure, there's losses, very highly publicized losses, but I can say that they're making money. So losing uh, on certain claims is a fact of life in the insurance industry. So um, I can say they're all bullish on it. The kinds of problems I see are sellers want to charge this, buyers want to pay this, and which leads to maybe some sh uh, companies not getting as much coverage as they would like. That's a problem, but I think that's not unusual for an emerging risk. Mm -hmm. This, I don't know where the right point in the middle is, but both sides are going to move um, as you get more experience, you get claims, you get better models. So I think that's going to solve itself. I see one challenge uh, of insurers being a little hesitant to provide more capacity because they are unsure about aggregation risk. And that's, that's my fault. I'm supposed to be building the model that makes <laughs> them confident that they can um, uh, go deeper um, as they see. But I think those are things that are gonna, are gonna be worked out with time. I don't see it as broken. I, s I still see it as a big opportunity for the industry and something that um, companies are excited about. Well, we should just end there on a positive note. Okay. But uh, I do want to leave some time for for some questions uh, from from the audience. Uh, so let me let me do this. Yes. <laughs> Smart man. Too late. Uh, if you if you can answer this, um, what uh, uh, what did we learn from the physical attack hmm. several years ago? on the electrical substation in South San Jose, which shut down the electricity to a lot of Silicon Valley. I know the FBI investigated it, but you may, I assume you weren't involved. The only one I know about is, uh, is actually shots fired. Uh, there was a, it was a about the physical attack, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, the, the shots fired. What did we learn about the, it? In the grid, when the power went down. I don't know that we learned, I don't know. 
I don't know. I wasn't there. Crazy people do crazy things. I don't know what happened. Question at the back. Hi. Move forward. Sure. Hi. So uh, I work with a consumer organization. My name is Bernie Birnbaum. And um, so a couple of quick points. The first is that uh, this idea of innovation, let the cyber market develop, sounds great. But the idea of sort of unleashing cyber policies on the small business sector without any kind of regulatory review sounds really perilous to us. Um, it's one thing to have a large company who understands its needs and can understand the policy, but to sort of have small businesses who don't really understand their needs and don't understand the intricacies of policy coverages, uh, that to let that into the market without any kind of policy review sounds like disaster uh, and think that you should address that. I don't think that you should just say, well, this is a surplus lines issue until the admitted market is willing to sort of take it on. Uh, the second point is that we're sort of big proponents for sort of harnessing market forces to, uh, to sort of help discipline or address market failures. So the idea of empowering consumers to apply some kind of market pressure to companies to improve uh, their cybersecurity along the lines of what Richard Clark said. Uh, for example, he talked about a penalty for each uh, breach or each data element, but giving consumers the right to sort of have greater control over their data uh, and to be able to sort of penalize or take action against companies who don't protect their data seems like a way to encourage this. And then the third point is that this seems like uh, the archetypical opportunity for the insurance industry to really become kind of the, um, the beacon for risk mitigation. And if there's one thing that regulators should really focus on, it's figuring out a way to encourage the insurance industry to do the types of things that Richard Clark said, to start getting involved with insurance policies that are really risk mitigation and risk prevention with an insurance kicker. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Bernie. Rick, director. Just, just to Mr. Birnbaum's first uh, uh, point, I'm, Bernie, I'm not so sure anyone up here said that we would let uh, a cyber policy uh, unleash <laughs> un unleash cyber policies on small and, and middle-sized companies without uh, regu regulatory approval. Our first job. As, as a regulator to protect the consumer. We take that fairly serious, and I, I don't, uh, I'm not so sure where you're coming from on unleashing uh, cyber policies on, on consumers. But the, they can purchase it now. Yes, by and large, it's a uh, uh, surplus lines market, but uh, we've learned that nationwide focus is on small, uh, con uh, small businesses and, and consumers. So I'm, I'm not so sure where you're coming from. Yeah, and, and and Bernie, with all due respect, I, maybe I wasn't maybe I wasn't clear in, in my identification of the of the middle market or the small business market as as um, an area where there needs to be more cyber coverage. My concern is there isn't the education there right now, and folks don't know it's available. They don't know that they have cyber issues to start with. So I think it's an it's an opportunity for regulators, for intermediaries, consumer groups um, to better educate small businesses so that they don't, um, they don't one, they, they start mitigating the risk, and then two, that they don't go bare if, if they believe that they need um, um, cyber coverage to, to protect them from, from, uh, from either foreseen or unforeseen risks. So it, it, it was meant to be, we've identified a potential market that, that needs help and needs education. We don't want to just, again, to use your word, unleash uh, policies on unsuspecting or, or, or less sophisticated buyers. All right, we're time for one more question. Um, hi, I have um, two related questions uh, for the regulators. Um, since the model law is going to be um, adopted soon, um, has there been a critical mass of states that you think are going to adopt the model law? Um, and the related question is, is there a push to have the model law become an accreditation standard? And if so, what's the timing on that? 
So do you consider Rhode Island and South Carolina to be a critical mass of states? <laughs> I, I, obviously, it's, <laughs> it's up to each state to, to con consider it at, at, at this point. Uh, I know of three or four that uh, will push it out uh, uh, for the 2018 session. The NEIC itself has, needs to address the issue of accreditation at, at some point soon. So, and this is uh, the, the approval, if it, if it is approved by executive committee, is kind of at a strange time because most of us are preparing our legislative packages right now for our governors. Um, so, so that might hold it up for a year. Um, we, we're certainly, we certainly got a pretty large group to vote for it, so we're certainly hopeful that it does become. And the F Committee on Accreditation is a long process. So you know, it would have to be something that's identified, sent to the F Committee, voted on by, the, so it's, it's not something that you simply say, oh, it's an accreditation standard. So that's kind of in the future. Commissioner Doak, last question is yours, sir. Yep, thank you. Um, great panel, I really appreciate it. I, one of the comments that was made by the uh, lunch speaker, uh, Richard Clark, um, I, I kind of like the idea of the uh, private uh, center of excellence, uh, and I appreciate him being an economic development guy for the state of Oklahoma, for the University of Tulsa, by the way. <laughs> uh, but I think that that has a lot of, uh, of, of credibility with building that center of excellence or an institute to be able to be a public policy think tank and move into a direction or wherever that may be housed. I think that could really uh, advance the ball. And I was just wondering, just a question to you all on, do you think that the, the evolution of personalized blockchain will possibly have a future, um, maybe that's, I'd, I'd be just interested, I haven't really had that discussion today, but could that be the link to maybe maximize personal security better in the future? Just a question. Anybody want to handle one with that one? I, I think the um, financial institutions in New York are the first really to, to, to play around with blockchain. I think blockchain is going to be phenomenal if everything that they say it can do, it does. Um, but it still is going to take a, a period of time. I think once you get down to outside of the FI space, the next space is really um, for medical information, and then you're going to find other usages after that. So there's a tremendous amount of capital that's being pushed into the industry right now. Um, we're having discussions all the time about blockchain and the usages thereof, and there's some really, really cool innovations that are coming out of it, but it is going to take a period of time because it still is untested. It's kind of like where we were with encryption standards a couple years ago there are different encryption standards even at that. So from a blockchain perspective, we're just in the infancy, but some really, really cool things. And I work a lot with FinTech and they're heavily, heavily, heavily involved in it. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, well aware we're just about out of time. I'm also well aware of the uh, very famous Stanford study that said the quality of a panel is directly proportionate to the number of ferns on stage. So <laughs> with all of these, please join me in thanking what was an excellent panel. Turn it back over to our master of ceremonies, Mr. Lasky. And I did get your question, sir, and, and maybe that's a great tee up for this event next year. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm glad you recognized that I did tweet a question at you. I, I did. Um, I figured out how to do that. Uh, so first, thank you very much. This panel was uh, fantastic. And um, I want to thank all of you for attending today. We're basically done. Um, we would love to do something like this again next year since I'm authorized to speak on behalf of Stanford <laughs> University. <laughs> it's not true. Uh, but yes, it would be great. Um, one thing we're thinking a lot about at the Cyber Initiative, and I know we've had some conversations about it, is to work on a white paper coming out of this day and some of the research we've been doing uh, to start keep moving forward uh, when it comes to uh, making the kind of improvements uh, we've been talking about today. Uh, the question I did tweet at you, uh, which we didn't have time to do, which we won't do now, was if, if I, would, I would love to hear privately from each panelist if there was one area of research you would want more work done in, uh, what would it be? That's a really crucial question for us at the Stanford Cyber Initiative to, to focus on. I think we're thinking a lot about future work streams and where we go from here. The blockchain question, Commissioner Doak, is actually a great one. And there's really interesting work being done about digital identity over the blockchain and the security of that. Um, that's a, uh, we could do a whole nother day just on blockchain. We won't open it up now. 
but that's a fascinating area to look in and a great uh, question and maybe, again, great for next year. Uh, on that note, thank you all for being here. Um, I don't think I have any more uh, announcements. Uh, and thanks to everyone for participating.